All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, this is the second technical session of the afternoon. Uh, today we got uh, Roger Lund from Network Center. Uh, Roger has a background about 20 years or so, I believe, in the IT background. Um, today he's going to be talking about uh, Veeam. And obviously it's a pretty hot topic right now with ransomware. Um, and Roger's going to talk to you about how Veeam uh, can protect you. So thanks, Roger. Yeah, you bet. You guys hear me okay? All right, good, because I like to talk a lot. So that'll be good. Um, I'm going to try to keep this interactive a little bit. So um, I've got some slides. I've got a live demo. Um, Mike's got some footballs. So um, if anybody has questions, you'll get a football tossed at you. And hopefully you can catch it. If not, it's the best attempt, right? So um, a little bit about myself, right? So uh, Roger Lund here in Network Center. Um, I'm a solutions architect. And you know, I, as Mike alluded to, I've been in the industry for a while. Um, I suppose in the early 2000s, I started really focusing on VMware. Uh, and been doing VMware um, for many years in the industry, running everything from tier one applications to you know you name it uh, on that platform. Um, I've got background being a v, v, v Mug leader in Minneapolis for I did that for about five years, and I still am one of the V Mug leaders in St. Cloud, Minnesota. So uh, you know background there. Um, back in 2007, I started blogging, and I'm still. A bad blogger, meaning that I don't do it as much as I should, but um, still have an active blog, uh, vbrainstorm.com. And there's a couple of us out there that, you know, put content out there. Though I'll say it's probably been a couple months at least since I've got fresh content, just because life gets busy, right? Um, otherwise, you know, I've always been a person that's interested in things like storage, uh, disaster recovery, and backup, and networking, and Linux, and things like that, right? So I said. I tend to be a technical person, so you know, um, bear with me if you're not. Um, I will sure take questions as we go. So you know, I want this to be interactive, right? So the slides are here to be pretty. I really want this to be about what you guys are, you know, seeing in the world. And I'll talk a little bit about you know some examples of you know how customers are doing it, or how they should be doing it, or how they shouldn't be, those types of things, right? So, all right. So the challenge here um, is ransomware, you know, and it's increasing, right? Um, if you look at, you know, what they're saying with, you know, obviously the year of COVID, you know, 71%, you know, surveys basically shows that there's, you know, experts are worried about ransomware. Um, and, and it's a, a thing that um, is gonna happen and it's, it's a when, right? Not necessarily an if, right? And so I just kind of pulled some statistics here, not to go through these line by line, but just to show you that, you know, it's increasing. It's not a thing that's going away. It's not like a trend. You know, it isn't something that is a fad um, in the industry. So, you know, be aware of the challenges of, you know, ransomware. Uh, is there anybody here, before I kind of get going, is anybody, here that doesn't know what ransomware is. Everybody's familiar with the concept, right? And the idea is, is that they're gonna grab your data and hold it against your, you know, your will. Uh, and usually there's some sort of demand there, right? Um, money, whatever. So, um, you know, it's a challenge that the industry sees a lot. And so I kind of wanted to talk about Veeam and how you can protect yourself with that. So, um, first off, before we get going, um, you know, I'm gonna make some assumptions that people are familiar with Veeam. I uh, didn't kind of go into the entire product, um, but I can talk about that for a little bit. If somebody isn't familiar with what Veeam is and how it works, I can kind of talk about that. I do have some slides that talk about some of the components of Veeam and, um, you know, some of the, the details that we'll be going into are around the scale out repositories that Veeam uses and how to configure the different components along the way to be immutable uh, for backups, right? So as you can see here, these are different technologies um, that Veeam has and really we're talking about the top two in this, um, you know, in this portfolio of products, right? And so these are kind of like features that they, you know, have. You know, um, you, you kind of talked about this before, right? You really can't prevent this anymore from happening. 
And so, you know, if you haven't thought about it, you know, there's some things that I won't cover today, talking to your insurance company, right? Understanding, um, you know, what, what you're liable for, and all those things are probably some more important things along the way, right, as well. But really what I'm gonna focus on is how to use Veeam to um, recover when it happens. And it's building that framework, right? The idea is we know we're talking about it at least, that we know we can't prevent it from happening, so then how do we build a framework to be able to recover, just like we've always done, we've been able to recover backups, right? That's not a new thing. But being able to recover you know, from a total lack of data, right? Um, knowing that your data is there and you know, what that framework looks like. So first off, I'm gonna ask, is anybody here that uh, isn't doing any backups at all? I just wanna kinda get a feel for the room. So everybody, everybody's running backups? Who here is actually using Veeam? Okay, great. So we've got a good number. Just out of curiosity, is there anybody that's not running 10 or 11 but still on like an older version of Veeam? Okay, everybody's in our current version. Most of the functionality we're talking about here is in version 11. Um, so you know, if you haven't went to 11, uh, 11 uh, A is out, the first release, update release. So you know, I would say it's, it's a, a stable release at this point, be able to go that direction. Um, you know, I know there are um, most of your providers doing even things like Cloud Connect. They're you know fully tested and certified. Those uh, you know those of you that want to go to 11, there are some um, you know that have said they're still testing 11A, right? So if, if you're going to go to 11, I would go right to 11, not go to A, if you're using some of the Cloud Connect services. Um, and you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with Cloud Connect, and we aren't going to cover that too much today, that is basically using a hosted service provider as an extra destination for your backup data, right? And that's less about uh, ransomware and more about speed of recovery in most cases. You know, you want a really fast ability to, to recover your data. So it's kind of a separate subject. Um, so the back uh, couple pages there, um, I took all that from the first link here. Um, so I wanted to kind of provide that and you know, you'll get a copy of these. Um, you know, emailed out, right? And I just wanted to kind of outline the links, right? So there's, they've got several white papers about, you know, how to protect. Um, there's a ransomware prevention kit. So you've got this light. Um, prevention kit here, walks through, you know, how to get started. There's some good information here. Um, and there's more, right? So white paper, best practices, right? Uh, this is cool because if you go out here, It'll actually, um, you know, give you some good, you know, things to do to, to prevent that. So, um, any of you guys familiar with the Veeam uh, documentation at all? Have you guys been out to the websites in the past? There's two places, right? There's like the regular Veeam website. It's got all the documentation. It's like on the left side. It has all the, you know, the tree where you can kind of pick on what you're trying to do. There's also a best practices website, um, which. You know, I, I kind of link to, but there, you know, shows a lot of good information as well. So there's a couple areas out there of good resources for you guys. So the solution that we're talking about today is immutability, right? And how to get there. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the three, two, one rules. Anybody here know what that means? Not at all. All right. So the idea with with backups and, and not just Veeam, right, is you wanna have three copies of data and two different types of media, right? And the idea there is, is that, you know, if you have a disaster, you know, you want that in a state that isn't easily compromised, right? So this back in the day would be, you had your production data, you had a copy of it on disk usually, like your tape, you know, and then you'd go to the long-term archive, right? Today's world, what's that mean? That usually means you disk target, your production data is your original copy, and then some sort of a cloud. And we can take that a, a step further by doing archive, right? Um, and having, you know, even longer term with low cost options like um, Glacier, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Any questions? Anybody want a football? No? All right. So, you know, um, how do you get ultra resilient backups, right? 
the idea is you've got different tiers, and I'll kind of get into this a little bit, but you've got different tiers. You've got your, your performance tier. You've got your capacity tier. You've got your archive tier. And using Veeam's technology with scale-out repositories allows you to achieve this, right? Um, there are some other benefits to scale-out repositories, and I'll get into that, but um, you know, it's a technology that I believe was introduced in 10, if I'm not mistaken. Really kind of lets you um, do some cool things with metadata manipulation and you know, being able to scale both performance and capacity through all different types of media. Today we're gonna to talk about the Veeam triple play just because it sounds cool. So, um, you know, and on this slide, as you can see, right, there's on this tier, we've got different, different things we can talk about. Today we're talking about Linux hardened repository, okay? Not to say that these aren't valid solutions, and today we're talking about Amazon S3 for the capacity tier, and we'll be focusing on Amazon Glacier for the archive tier. Now, the idea here is every one of these has full versioning and lock control, meaning that from within the job, you can actually say, I want to retain this much revisioning, right? Control of that data. So the idea is, is I have full control all the way from performance to archive. Now, that isn't saying that you can't achieve, oops, can't achieve, um, you know, good backups only having one of these be, you know, because you are, have, you do have a immutable location there. But, you know, today we're, we're gonna talk about the, the entire scenario. And um, I'm open to when we get a little further, if we wanna talk about scenarios and why you'd go one direction or the next, right? And some of those things, so. I'm gonna pause here. Is this kind of what you guys are expecting, subject-wise? Is this kind of what you're looking for? So, okay, any questions? Yeah, great. Yeah. Linux is usually pretty low cost. I'm <laughs> just giving you a hard time. Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, we can do some things, right? So if we, if this just wasn't an option from a, an architecture solution, and we say, hey, I'm going to achieve one of these or both of these, but this just isn't an option today, right? Um, if you have a NAS or a DAS or some sort of a DDP appliance that has snapshots, you can use those snapshots, right, to provide immutability. Because generally, in almost every case, those snapshots are not exposed to any type of external access methodology, right? So we don't have um, NFS services, we don't have iSCSI services that are exposing those, there's no SMB access, right? And so, you know, those are ways to be able to protect that data. You know, um, obviously, uh, you can also do things like, you know, if you're laying data down, on a DAS, and you have two DASs, you make copies, and you know you can do some things, right? Um, the idea, though, is even if you do that, it can be a little hard to know if you have compromised data at that level, right? And so that's kind of the idea of having a hardened repository is, you know, I'm using Veeam's intelligence and their technology to guarantee that that isn't there, right? So that being said, this isn't crazy. Um, you could take this and present a LUN to a VM, right, on a, a box. You could do a physical, there's no reason you can do a physical Linux box. You know, realistically, you're, you know, walk through it, you're just presenting a disk into that Linux OS, right, and then you're adding that Linux into the inventory, and you're then installing services from Veeam to extend into that Linux box securely, right? So then you can use it as a repository. Other questions? Okay. So discussion point, right? Um, probably could have started this when we started talking about it. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the architecture so you guys have an understanding of where I'm going for before we start getting too, too technical because it, it gives you a little bit. So 
um, you know, beam architecture, we've got one or more source, right? Meaning that I've got vCenter, I've got VMware hosts, I've got a NAS, I've got physical file shares, agents, you know, all these types of things, right? So one or more hosts. Um, we've got one or more backup repositories. So, you know, when you install Veeam by default, you have that instance be your repository. It's also your proxy, you know, it's kind of everything, right? So you start there, you get, you know, as you know in Veeam, you can scale out repositories. You can have five, you can have 100, you can have as many as you want, right? Obviously, there's some diminishing returns there, but the idea is, is that it's a very flexible architecture but you know, I just wanted to talk about that. And the same thing is as a repository. You can have repositories, one per cluster, you know, one per location. There's lots of different things you can do there um, based on your architecture, what you're laying it down on, right? Um, you know, if you're not doing redundancy on your device, you know, you'd want to have multiples and you know, do different copies between them. So there's lots of different things there. So, so the, you know, just so everybody's, on, I'm just kind of setting the, the ground here a little bit. So, and then the scale our repository, I alluded to before, um, allows you to do a couple things, right? You have a performance tier that you can have more than one device added to. Why is that important? It might be that you start out with a NAS, you've got one gig networking, you've got four drives, and that's adequate. But then the business changes, right? And you add 16 databases in two days, something, right? And it's three times the size or, you know, it, the jobs go from two hours to 22, right? Well, now I have the ability to add one more NAS or one more Linux repository to that performance tier. And it's gonna, you know, I can choose some metrics when I go through the wizard and say, oh, I wanna do this by data locality or I wanna do it by performance, you know? So I can kind of allow it to choose how to lay that data down, right? So really flexible. It also lets you, you know, do some interesting things like, you know, I have a new Linux repository. I've got new hardware. I've got an old one. How do I get rid of that old device without losing backups, right? I can seal one of the extents. So I can seal one of those devices and it'll automatically migrate the data off that extent to the new device, right? Without having to change your backup jobs or anything like that. So a lot of flexibility there. Um, and again, the idea is, is that you've got multiple buckets, multiple technologies, you, you know, you can go to cloud, you can go to object for, for your, your capacity tier. The archive, you could do, you know, Glacier, right? There's lots of things out there. You could do, you know, your own, maybe you like SwiftStack and you wanna build a SwiftStack cluster. Everybody's familiar, probably not, but anyway, you can get really nerdy and do open source and, you know, and do a lot of your own cloud platforms for this stuff too. So, um, set the ground there a little bit. Um, so what we're gonna do is go through the Veeam immutable solution using the triple play as our, as our like, you know, catalog or blueprint. We're gonna go and set up each one of these. So again, I've got in my example here, one performance repository, one capacity repository. I've got one archive repository. Um, I'm gonna go through how to set up the Linux and get it into Veeam. I'm not gonna go through and show you how to install Linux. <laughs> so, um, and I didn't, you know, didn't necessarily go through how to the, the, some of the steps to prep the VM either, because I kind of figured that if you're gonna go down that path, you're gonna follow the documentation there. I'm assuming that you know how to get a Linux VM ready um, or physical host ready. I'm showing you how to add that resource into Veeam to, to get to the next step, right? So. We'll go through that, and then we're gonna go through the actual repo configuration as well. Questions? Am I talking too fast, too slow? Good, okay, excellent. So here's the setup, this is the nerdy stuff. So uh, hardware components, right? I've got a server virtual in this example. Um, we've got a NAS, and a, you know, we do a lot of IX systems. In this case, I've got a VM, uh, we've got um, some networking speeds and feeds here. Uh, I'm doing one gig in this scenario. I recommend 10 gig if possible or more. Um, 10 gig, as weird as it sounds, makes a huge difference. Not just from your backup times, but restores, right? When you have to pull this data back, if you've got a you know, 500 gig or two terabyte VM, well, it might take you over one gig, six hours to restore it. You know, 
depending on you know, what that infrastructure looks like. But this is a lot of data to go over one gig link, right? It's a math equation, right? So I'd recommend that. Um, here we're doing S3, and what I'm gonna show you is, is AWS's implementation. You can do this in other places. Um, certified is, option for the triple play today is AWS. Um, I have clients that are doing it on Backblaze. You actually just go through and say you're using AWS, and you put in the Backblaze <laughs> information, and it does work. So as long as the cloud vendor uses the same you know, technology, or I should say technology, the same standards as Amazon, it'll work, right? Work with that cloud vendor if you're gonna do that, right? And know that if you have to do have to call Veeam, you might have some challenges there, right? But if you know, if you do have an existing cloud you're using, you can have the conversation with the cloud vendor, it'll probably work. Um, you know, they just go by a, a base standard of S3, right? Archived here, we're gonna use Glacier, right? And then log logical, you know, we're talking about a single proxy virtual scale repository, Linux, AWS, and Glacier. Um, we're gonna go through kind of the steps of that. Before we start, I talked about um, the best practices web page that Veeam has, right? And so as you look down here, it's you know bp.veeam.com, right? So it's a great resource for you know um, going out and just seeing like how should I set up a Linux? You know what are some of the things I have to do, right? And they they've got some things here. I'm just gonna take a quick pause. You know, talk about keep it simple. Make sure they're physically secured, right? And again, I didn't cover that here. You can refer to the guide of how to do those things. But the idea is, you know, don't, if you're gonna make a VM or a physical device for your hardened repository, probably should secure it. Don't use a three character password. Don't leave, you know, don't leave it wide open with the same username and password you use for all of your other VMs or all your other infrastructure, you know, make it secure, right? Um, and, you know, kind of do some things that you should be doing all the time. But if you aren't following best practices today and you're just doing a default install and some of this stuff, then maybe take the time, right? And go out and take a peek. But good resource here. So, in Veeam, what I'm doing here is I'm just adding, I go to inventory and you add a new Linux, right? Put in the DNS name. We're creating a single use user, right? So you would go create, I don't know if anybody's a Linux person, but user add, you know, you put in their username and, you know, the, the criteria that you're gonna use, you do a password change on it, you set the password, right, of that user and then you would use that here, and it's the only time you're gonna use that user, right? This is one time, so you don't wanna use root, that's <laughs> what I'm trying to say, you know, or the default user that you set up. So, as we go through here, type that in here, I just did local, Veeam, password, right? Basic, this is all defaults. So to say, you know, this is the right device, say yes. Let's then go ahead and install the components. You know, hopefully you don't have any reds, but pretty straightforward here. Um, we're you know, just gonna kinda go through and add that in there. And you'll see it's successful here, and then you can go to the next page. We're gonna add that back repository now. So basically we've added it to the system as a Linux resource in Veeam. Now we're gonna add it as a repository, right? So we're doing repository, and so, direct attached, we're picking Linux. We name it. You'll pop over to this screen, and then after you hit the populate button, it shows all the volumes and all the, in your setup of your Linux when you're picking it, you know, you can do some different things, you know, you can do an LVM, you can do um, F-disk, you know, some different ways to provision disk. I went old school, right? So. Um, I just did an old school default next partition, right? <laughs> when I did that, but you could get fancy to LVM and you know and add disk that way too. But I just did you know for the test here, I just did a one terabyte disk. 
when you come over here, it's going to look like this. And then if you hit the, you know, this populate, and it shows the, you know, after you select it, it shows the space. Um, you know, you create this as part of the process. And if you look at that best practices document, it's going to walk you through how to create this as XFS, right? And so you're formatting that one volume as XFS so you can do fast cloning. Um, this is where you get the feature that isn't there if you don't use a Linux hard repository. You were asking about if I just have an as or DAS or something. So this is, you know, this is um, the concept here is like Veeam is able to protect that data inside of its platform, right? This is the default screen you see. You know, so to say this and kind of go through, right? So that's the easy part. And then we're gonna go and scale out repository. Any questions about Linux, setting it up? Anybody, I guess, who here has done Linux or is familiar with Linux? You know, got, we got one, two, three guys. All right, excellent. Um, let's see, you wanna toss me a football? He, he asked a question, so. I know, right? Excellent. Sorry about the delayed response. So, anyways, if anybody can you, know, you can make up questions. They don't even have to be legitimate questions. I didn't specify. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh, I love it. All right. So I'll walk back here. So next, we're gonna do a scale repository. Um, this is something that's new in ten. Huge feature set for Veeam, um, and you know. You can do a lot with it, like I talked about. So you kind of go through, we're gonna name it, we're gonna hit add, and then we're gonna add that new repository that we had, right? What we don't wanna do is add the default repository. <laughs> that always gets created, right? I'll, I'll say one thing, when you, um, if you have repositories out there that you wanna read, maybe you've always had a Linux repository, yet you're already using it. When you get to the spot and you try to add it, it's gonna complain if you're using it for your backup configuration. Because you know in Veeam you can back your configuration files up. So you have to move that off to back to your default or just create like a new one, give it 10, 10 gigs somewhere and you know and set that up for your, your backups, configuration backups. You can't have your configuration backups be in your scalar repository. So just keep that in mind, right? Um, but you could pop that, you know, pretty much anywhere. So so you know, we're like Keep going here, and here's where I was talking about. You can choose how it wants, to, how you want to handle your performance placement policies. So, in most cases, you just have one. You're going to use data locality, right? But you know, if you wanted to, you know, have multiples, and you know, one of them is faster, and you know, those types of things. You know, you could have basically a higher speed, so you already have one, right? You go through this twice, basically this process twice. You already have one, you wanna add another one and it's all SSD. What's gonna add your incrementals to that spot, right? So you can do some interesting design things there. Again, with a scale out repository. Outside of the scope, but it's pretty cool. We're gonna check this box here, right? Um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna hit add. Um, and then I generally come back and we'll adjust this, but a lot of times, and this is up to the, you know everybody has their own policies, I like to do this top one, right? I wanna make a backup copy right away, go up to that. And generally, I don't like this, because I wanna know where my data is a little more, right? But that can be handy. You know, if I have a really small performance tool, I can say, well, I'm gonna move them after 14 days, and then there's an override button. If I check that override button, it says, hey, at 60% or 80% or whatever, put that ad up you know, to the cloud or you know, an on-prem object storage or whatever you have there for, for that object, right? So again, kind of cool outside of the scope, but neat. We're gonna go ahead and do the Amazon S3 here, and then it's gonna, it'll ask you, you know, which one are we doing, right? We're doing the top. I'm original in my naming, you can see. I already had credit, you know, put my credentials in here. I didn't wanna kinda show that because, you know, obvious reasons. It's an actual live account, right? So, um, though it's in a non-production spot, so, and it'll be going away after this, but 
you need to go out here and you pick a region. You have to go log in first to the Amazon, and I don't know if anybody's went out there before, but you go to the Amazon console, right? You go to the object, the object storage so solution section. You're gonna pick your, where you want your data. You have to create a bucket. And then you have to create a folder. If you don't do that and you try to add it, it's just gonna be blank. It'll not see a spot. You can't hit okay at that screen, right? Pretty straightforward otherwise. I only put limit this because, you know, Again, this is a dev environment that I've got this out going on, you know, dev test environment going on out there. I didn't want to put like 100 terabytes of data out there for, for this conference, sorry guys. But limited data, even though I think it's not reusing very much. And here again, now we've got the same checkbox. Hey, I can guarantee immutability for 30 days, right? Or whatever I want there, so. Um, and then when you go out to this spot and you're creating these, you know, the, this bucket, after, in AWS, after you create the bucket, you can actually go in and define these inadequate, infrequent access storage classes. And the reason you'd wanna do that is to save a little bit of money, right? Now, that being said, make sure that it's not so slow that, you know, that it doesn't meet your SLA, right? So keep that in mind, but um, you know, in this case, I know I have a good Linux repository. I've got the data there. I can go to the cheaper tier, right? Now, if I didn't have a hardened repository in my first step, I would maybe want to leave this at a faster tier, you know? And, and again, it's, it's not a huge savings, but it, you know, it adds up if you've got terabytes, terabytes of data out there. So. You need to hit finish there on, on adding that, and then it'll, it'll resume here, and here you can see that I've changed that setting, right? So, and I've unchecked this. Next, it's gonna say, hey, what about archive? Where do I wanna you know, put the archive data? Glacier, right? And hey, how old do I wanna put that data out there, right? 90 days is what I said. So same thing, it's already uses the same account. It uses the, it looks the same, but it's actually not. It's actually a separate console you need to go in for Glacier. <laughs> so you have to go out to Glacier and basically do the same thing. It looks a little different, but again, they've got great documentation out there. And here's the mutability, right? And so this is the idea, and oh, I'm guaranteeing that I have that for nine, you know, for basically as long as I want to keep that data out there. And that's again controlled a little bit about when you create this bucket, if you want to have it ever remove data or not. And you know, you get a lot of control of the cloud. So, and here's the deep storage, which means slow. But that's Glacier, right? The name kind of gives it away. So. And then it's going to hit, you know, hit next, apply. Then it pops up. Hey, you know, when you need to spin up stuff out in the cloud, if you have to restore from Glacier, what are you gonna put it on, right? You can, I didn't show all four, three options, but there's like basic cost perspective, there's a middle and there's like an expensive, right? And it goes from like two to four to, maybe it's two to eight to 16 cores, right? I did small here. If you don't have VPCs or subnets or security groups, it actually lets you do that here. And once you kind of get there, right, go to the next screen. So discussion point here. Tell me about what you guys see a little bit, and then we can kind of jump into demo for, for a couple minutes. So questions about challenges? Has anybody been in that scenario where you couldn't get data back after ransomware? Has anybody had that happen? Yeah? At least one person? OK. Yeah. yeah. All right, all right. So you know, um, some of the challenges we see, I see out there, is recoverability. To my first question, has anybody experienced really slow backups or really slow restores? Yeah, exactly. So again, when I'm talking about you know scale out repositories, I'm talking about the networking speeds. You start to talk about things like, hey. You know, what's the disk look like underneath that hardened repository, right? We like to talk about things like IX systems in the true NAS scenario, um, because again, it's a enterprise level product with enterprise level support agreement. 
you know, and you can choose to do a tower, which has got, you know, more of the basic next business day. Or they've got fully high available units with 24-7 support, dual controller, single controller, you know, and I mean, they scale. I mean, we coded one for a client that was 16 petabytes, right? So they go all the way, right, from less than a, pet a terabyte all the way up, right? So again, that's kind of our standard. And then the difference between that and going to, you know, to Amazon and buying an as is gonna be performance and support, right? It also lets you do some interesting things just in case you have that event where you have to restore that data, which is like, hey, maybe I wanna stand up a VM on that unit or I need to serve SQL off of it, right, in that event. You have that horsepower, right? They do be able to do those things, so those make a difference. All right, demo time. This might work. Excellent. Super secure password on my demo machine. That's 120 characters, I'm really fast. So I was just running some backups earlier, so that's why you see all that stuff. Pretty simple environment, like I talked about before. Um, if we go down here, I've got some basic you know, I've got a proxy. I've got my, my repository, my Linux repository here. Here's my Glacier and here's my S3, right? Here's my scale out repository. If I walk through this, there's the Linux. I just have it, you know, set for data locality. There's my S3, right, all the stuff we kind of saw, right? So nothing crazy. I've got a couple jobs out here. The one we'll talk about today is the file server, right? Um, it's all virtual, this is all on top of a single server, right, <laughs> next, to, next to my desk. Um, but you know, still pretty decent little performance for, for a box. So, you know, let's, let's just walk through what it looks like if I have to restore one of these, right? So anybody has probably went through this once or twice, but. So we're just gonna go through the wizard. We can do different things here. We can do an entire, we're gonna try to do some guest level stuff and see if we can really can break this lab. Microsoft Windows. I'm gonna look at my job. Right. Now. Here you can see, you know, my different copies, right? Now, most of these looks like they're on all the different tiers. So here you can see I've got multiple different jobs of these, uh, or not jobs, multiple different locations here. So we're just gonna pick one of these and go through the wizard. So what, not any different, as you see, this process isn't like strangely different than a regular Veeam backup, right? The restore wizard is the same. There's no different process to restoring that data. It's just, you know, it's been like this, I think, since version seven, right? I've been using Veeam a while, so. We'll give it a minute, it's a lab, so it's a little slow. Um, but the idea is, is like, it's just gonna be regular restore. Just go out there, grab the file, copy it back, that's all there is to it, right? Once it's done, I'll show you too how you can kind of see what, um, in the cloud where you've got backups. You can kind of see that from the Veeam interface as well. Questions while we're waiting at all? Yeah. Um, not at this this point, no, it's gonna pull that down, right? Um, but you know, did the previous point you could see, right? Um, and it's an all of them because I've got that retention lock. Now if you didn't have all three a triple play, let's just say you had a single play. Meaning that I've got just Glacier, well then all of them are gonna only say Glacier for my backup point after a certain period. So maybe you've got a smaller window on top that are all gonna say local repository, 
or performance that was just going to say the other. So, otherwise, I can show you where you can see it at at job level as well once this kind of finishes. I should have timed this before. So while that's running, here under your backups, you can see. you know, your different backups and your retention and if it's immutable, right, from from this wizard or this screen. You wanna go see what's out in cloud, you go over here, right, and you take a look at this level and then it's gonna show those backups out of the cloud, right? And again, what the retention is on them, so, and I think my window, yeah. So anyways, you can kind of see it there, but yeah, it doesn't give you a, now depending on the type of backup job, I believe if you do an entire VM backup and some of those other options, it will. Let's see here, working. Let's just start one more, and we might not be able to get the full, you know, wizard to, to go all the way through the process, but the idea is, is there isn't any difference. So if we do an entire VM restore, So here you can kind of see, again, they're gonna be all of them the same, but this is where you'd be able to kind of see you know, where that is, right? So if I would have chosen 15 days, 30 days, and 90, then you would see, you know, and again, I didn't, I only had a couple of weeks to kind of get my demo set up, but it had been running these for six months, and we're going back six months, and I had 30 days, then we'd be able to see like just those longer ones would be up in the glacier, does that make sense? Go and slow. Anyways, it'll pop up once we get that far. So I'm gonna kind of leave it at this. And if anybody wants to, you know, come up and grab a business card, I think I've got a pocket full of business cards. So if you've got questions and follow up, feel free to grab those. And uh, we'll be emailing out a copy of the deck. So feel free, you know, to uh, let me know there too if you guys have questions once you get your hands on that. So anything else that you guys can think of while this is kind of going? Any other questions? Yeah, so I mean, uh, different way of doing it, right? Nothing is saying that data is bad or, you know, your other solutions are bad. It's more about like, you know, can they can they provide air-gapped immutability and those things? Yes, probably, right? Um, just know that you know what the what the technology can do. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to every solution, right? Veeam is super configurable, super flexible. But you can get yourself in a bind as well, right? It's only as good as the hardware you, you, know, you put it on, right? And the way you configure it, right? Something like a Datto, it's a pre-configured appliance. You IP it, set the jobs up, right? I mean, it's, it's only designed to work one way, right? So, you know, that's gonna work that direction, right? It's gonna work that way because it's, it's a designed appliance like that, right? So, again, um, different way, different way of doing it. Um, Veeam obviously lets you do lots of different licensing methodologies. You know, you can do rental through MSPs. You can buy licenses. You can, you know, just in top of AWS. You know, there's just lots of ways to configure, right? And so that's why they provide such detailed documentation. You know, and a strong partner program, right, to be able to help you make sure that. It's performing and acting and restoring the way it should be. So, does that answer the question? Okay, good. All right, well, this is being fast, so apologies there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And again, 
It's just a different way of doing it. It's a very different product. You know, kind of apples and oranges, right? Both will let you protect your data, though, to be fair. So. All right. How much more time do we have? We're pretty much it. All right, guys. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks a lot. And again, feel free to reach out. I've got some business cards up here at the top.